So I'm an infectious diseases and HIV physician. I started training in that about 10 years ago. I work in Dublin, um, in inner city Dublin, and about 30% of our people living with HIV are injecting drug users who would have a background of pretty extreme uh, social exclusion, intergenerational trauma. Um, and my interest in that continued to develop, and I did some work here in London uh, with uh, the Faculty for Homelessness and Inclusion Health, and then went back to Dublin and started to get into the field of ageing, um, as I could see that this was a really important uh, lens to be looking at the people that I work with. So I'm actually going to start here with a case study, which is very apt today, because the people that I'm going to tell you about, called Iola and William, met when they were living in London. And these are two of my favourite patients. I have lots of favourite patients, but these are two um, for many reasons. One is that William has a really cool hat with loads of badges on it. That he It's a London thing, apparently, that he picked up when he was living here, and now he still wears his hat with all his badges and they're still so in love, this couple, uh, even though they've had really, really hard times. And it's every time I see them, I'm struck by how wonderfully they support each other and how much that contributes to their, their managing their conditions. But they're both in their early 50s. Um, William mobilizes with a Zimmer frame. Iola has lots of difficulty mobilizing. They both have a lot of chronic diseases. Iola has really, really bad chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and a lot of cardiovascular disease. They both have cognitive impairment, difficulty rem keeping track of all their appointments. And it's so sad to see these people in their early 50s who've got grandchildren that they want to look after, and they're really limited. Um, and I keep sometimes trying to say to them, I know you're only in your 50s, but your bodies are like you're in your 90s, so be a bit kind of, you know, to recognise that, because I think they feel very frustrated. And what's also striking is how poorly the system can cope with them. So because they're under 65, they're not eligible for the home care supports that older people would have access to. So they're very characteristic of the patients that I see who have very high <laughs> rehab needs. Um, and they're also characteristic in their backstory, which is a background of social exclusion, injecting drug use in the past, prison stays for William, um, uh, and how that's contributed to things. So we all know that when we look at somebody of the same age, uh, uh, I had a taxi driver in Dublin recently, and I, I was struck because he looked about 30, and he was actually in his mid-60s, and I said to him, what's the secret? And he like basically did an ageing lecture in the taxi, so he told me, yeah, my mom and my, you know, all her sisters and brothers lived until their 90s, and they're all really healthy, and I don't smoke, and I exercise, and I have a great life, and I love it, and there was successful ageing in a package. But then, you know, the contrast is that, that then there are other people of the same chronological age who biologically, functionally, and how they feel are a totally different age to, to what their passport says, if they have one. And there's loads of ways to try and capture this. So some of my background is in immunology and real cellular stuff, so you can play around with cells and try and get to see the age of, on a cellular level. At frailty scores, uh, as Jaime was talking about, in referrals to their clinic, you can look at multimorbidity, you can look at how likely somebody is to die, and they're all essentially telling you the same thing. And we know from work looking at multimorbidity and HIV that people living with HIV probably age about five years more rapidly than, the, than people without HIV. This is for a, a lot of reasons that remain to be teased out. But not everybody with HIV ages prematurely. And I think we're really seeing that increasingly as the drugs are less toxic in particular, because I think that was, and that came out in the story that Jaime was telling us about the man who had the peripheral neuropathy who'd been treated with the older HIV drugs. Um, but we see a lot of people who are aging more slowly than normal in our HIV clinic. So for me, a lot of it comes down to, to social status, to social experiences, to people's social context. And this, for me, is a really, really seminal paper that came out last year, about a year ago, in The Lancet. And it spoke to me in many ways. The first way is that if you think about anybody that you know who has been, say, homeless, think, have they been in prison? Usually they have. Have they exchanged sex for money or drugs? Frequently they have. Do they have addiction disorders? Frequently they have. So we abstractly, we kind of separate people out into these groups, but actually that's the same, same person. Uh, and we're talking about the same experience. And we know this is, is UK data. So if you live in, in Chelsea, seeing as we're in London, uh, if you live in a nice posh part of London, at any given age, this is your chance of dying. And if you live in the poorest part of London, you're twice as likely to die at that age just because of where you live. So if you're 20, you're not very likely to die, but you're twice as likely to die in Brixton as you are in Chelsea. If you're 90, it's much more likely that you're going to die within the next year, but it's still twice as likely in Brixton as it is in Chelsea. And that's known as the slope index of inequality. And about 30% of that difference can be corrected by smoking and exercise and what you eat. And about 
we don't know. And as an infectious diseases doctor, I think of like the era before we knew what bacteria and viruses were, and we thought, oh, they have malignant tumours, and you know, it's kind of like which which doctoring. Um, and to some extent, that's the stage that we are in understanding social determinants of health. We really don't understand it. But if you plot on that same slope index, these are people who are socially excluded, who have had one or more of those experiences of social exclusion. And I would add in Aboriginal people in Australia, First Nations people in Canada, in Ireland, where I'm from, people from the travelling community, people with severe and enduring mental health problems. Um, anybody who's socially excluded, it goes off the scale. So you're twice as likely to die at it, or sorry, 12 times more likely to die at any given age if you're a socially excluded woman and eight times more likely to die at a given age if you're a socially excluded man. So pretty striking. So not only is there a slope, there's a cliff. And again, we don't really understand it. This is multimorbidity data from national data from Scotland. Again, about a five year difference in that uh, onset of multimorbidity and the rate at which it accumulates depending on where you live, how rich the area that you live in is. But these are our homeless people that we looked at in Dublin. So this is the Scottish data mapped out. Here's 55 to 60 year olds, 85 year olds. Dark is eight or more chronic medical conditions. White is zero. And these are the homeless men, mainly men that we studied, who were in their 40s and 50s. So they're just off the scale in terms of their multimorbidity. And that's not all addiction related. That's including things that are, you know, osteoporosis that, that, that aren't mediated through addiction. And we also did some frailty measures that have been talked about already today by Jaime, but they're timed up and go. They looked like 90 year olds in a nationally representative study of, of Irish adults and falls. Mm. And this is their MOCA. So as a clinician, this is what I found most worrying. The average MOCA was 14 and there's MOCAs of four and 10 in there. And these are people who are being deemed who haven't had you know, a rehabilitation assessment, haven't had assessment by occupational therapy usually, and who are kind of left to fend for themselves in very, very challenging circumstances. So what's going on? Um, we don't really know. This is one of my favourite illustrations of how your social rank can affect your biology. So these are these fish that live in Lake Tanganyika um, in Africa. And in any set area, so say in an area the size of this room, there's loads of male fish, but only one gets to be dominant male. And he's this guy here. So he's brightly coloured, he's aggressive, he's sexually fertile. He sounds like a bit of a pain in the you know what. But anyway, and the rest of the male fish are non-dominant and they're, they're the guys on the left. But the guy on the right is brightly coloured, so okay, the, the female fish love him, but he's also very uh, visible to birds that like to eat these fish. So the dominant male keeps getting picked out. And in that area, after there's no longer a dominant male, one of the non-dominant males will change their biology, change what proteins their genes are transcribing, and become the guy on the right. Like, it's amazing. And this is fish. They don't have very complicated social systems. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so, so because of my background in immunology, we know that our bodies are primed to, to see danger. So they'll see viruses, they'll see bacteria, they'll see tissue injury. But what I propose is that because we are social animals, we see social stress, we see social exclusion, not being part of the tribe as much as a danger, and our bodies respond to it in the same way. And we know the theory for how HIV is causing accelerated aging is through inflammation. And I would hypothesize that social stress can cause inflammation too. And where we, certainly in Dublin, are really seeing the accelerated aging in people living with HIV is where people have the two things. So they have a chronic viral infection, HIV or hepatitis C, and then they also have huge social stress. Um, and this is work on primates showing the same thing, but basically based on your rank, your white blood cells do different things. So it very much comes down to adverse childhood experiences. I presume everybody here knows about them. This is really important when you're thinking about meeting those health needs. So um, when, when you're very small and somebody abuses you, I punch you, Colin, which I'm not going to do now. In this room, you could punch me back or you could call somebody to help you or you could do loads of things. But if I punched you when you were very small or abused you when you were very small and I was your parent, you don't have those tools at your disposal. So abuse and particularly neglect in childhood have very, very profound effects on people's biology and behaviour. And when you're looking in socially excluded populations, in the general population, most people have one or zero, one or maybe two adverse childhood events. But suddenly you're looking at people who almost all the time have experienced very severe, very di many forms of difficult experiences in childhood. And that has very, very profound effects on people's behaviours that I think 
as healthcare providers, we can be very poor at addressing. So our standard way sometimes of dealing with people who use drugs uh, used to be, well, you know, stop it. It's very bad for your health. You will die. Like, as if, I don't know, did we think they didn't realise that? It's not that simple. And in terms of expecting people to engage in scheduled healthcare, whether that's doing exercise, coming into clinic, doing all those things that we're trying to provide, all of those rely on you having self-worth, on you having a vision of yourself 10 to 20 years down the line, of you having the ability to read and plan your <laughs> schedule. There's loads of skills in there that we as healthcare providers tend to take for granted, but that we're not uh, properly set up to, to provide services to people who may not have those skills. So what we are trying to develop in Dublin is a specialty called inclusion health which is recognising that people who are excluded have very complex, very specific needs and that they need to be met by, by a specialist, uh, specially trained providers. Similar in many ways to a geriatric model because you can't, you know, it's not something you can fix with a pill. You need to work very much as part of a team with, with lots of people from different areas. And we've we found it really helpful. I think it reduces provider stress and it improves uh, patient outcomes and I'm hoping from this I've already got loads of great ideas from today that I can rob and put into our inclusion health service so thank you very much <laughs>